We would like to advise that the following program may contain real news, occasional philosophy, and ideas that may offend some listeners. This is The Future This Week. On Sydney Business Insights, I'm Sandra Peter. And I'm Kai Rima. Every week we get together and look at the news of the week. We discuss technology, the future of business, the weird and the wonderful, and things that change the world. Okay, let's start. Let's start. Today on The Future This Week, hashtag 996, working long, predicting work, and who dies on Game of Thrones. I'm Sandra Peter, I'm the director of Sydney Business Insights. I'm Kai Rima, professor at the Business School and leader of the Digital Structure Research Group. So Kai, what happened in the future this week? Work. The future of work or stories about work happened in the future this week. Hashtag 996, the controversy around long working hours in China has been all over the media. And we're also looking at some developments around using AI and data in the workplace. And AI predicting who dies on Game of Thrones. So our first story comes from the South China Morning Post, and it's titled Quantity or Quality, China's 996 Work Culture Comes Under Scrutiny. So first of all, what is 996? And this refers to the unofficial work schedule in China. So going from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week. And this has been a widely spread practice across Chinese tech companies Companies encouraging people to work on a 996 schedule, which means nine to nine, six days a week. That's working more than 70 hours a week every week. And this has been in the Chinese media for quite a while. The early reports were back in September 2016, where there were reports of employees working in tech companies over weekends and not being paid. And then end of last year, and again, flaring up in the middle of March this year, and in April in the Chinese media have been a number of tech companies come to the front. And chief among those have been two tech companies. One of them has been JD.com and Richard Liu, who's also been in the media for other reasons, talking about these practices and encouraging workers to do that. And then the story has finally been picked up by the Western media very late on, when Jack Ma, the founder of e-commerce giant Alibaba, who has spoken out on social media, coming actually in support of the 996 work practice. So he called it a blessing to work a 12-hour workday, six days a week. And interestingly, it's only recently that the Western media, such as the BBC, have picked up the story. And before we actually unpack this, we want to offer an interesting observation And that is that the reports in the Western media have been fairly factual and short, focusing on Jack Ma, who is a known person in the West, pretty much only pointing out what he said. Whereas in some of the English language Chinese media, such as the South China Morning Post, which we picked for this story, and Pan Daily, another Chinese outlet, have been much more elaborate and much more critical of the practice. So there seems to be a real controversy afoot in the Chinese media and on Chinese social media. And the discourse has gone so far as to spill over onto now Microsoft-owned open source developer platform GitHub, where a forum titled 996.icu was established referring to incidents where people work long hours, 996, and then land in the hospital, hence ICU, intensive care unit. So this is the practice that the founder of Alibaba, Jack Ma, wrote his lengthy blog post on social media about. And this was a few days ago on the 14th of April when he went to Weibo and he praised the practice saying, if we find things we like, 996 is not a problem. If you don't like your work, every minute is a torture, he said. I personally think that 996 is a huge blessing. How do you achieve the success you want without paying the extra effort and time? And this has been along the same lines as Richard Liu's comments, the CEO of JD.com, another one of the really large tech companies in China, who said that whilst he would never force employees to work a 996 schedule, every staff of JD.com must have a competitive spirit. Those who fool around all day long are not my brothers. I am responsible for the 180,000 families behind the 180,000 brothers. So I cannot cover for those 1% who fool around. I have no choice. So Richard Liu actually came out with much harsher words than Jack Ma. 
he distinguished the brothers, there's no sisters apparently, and the slackers, basically. And the article in Pandaly points out a number of categories of workers that Liu wants to weed out from his company. Those who fail to sacrifice, those who are not performing, those with low outcome salary ratios, and also, very controversially, older employees with family obligations that get in the way of devoting yourself fully to the company. And to put this in context, JD.com has been losing money for about 12 years in a row now. So these remarks of Liu's were also accompanied by the fact that they have announced that they will replace the courier's fixed base salaries with only commission-based compensation. And alongside that, reduce the employee housing funds from 12% to 7%. And that, let's remember, it still exceeds the government requirement of 5%. But sending logistics staff to be completely reliant on commissions is a direct result of what he says are not sustainable business practices. And this has been the number one trending topic on platforms like Weibo and Baidu, but has received to date no coverage in Western media. So there has been a huge backlash on social media against those comments and also the practice of working 996 and has been pointed out that while Liu demands loyalty from the brothers, the employees, that same loyalty is not shown by the company when they rigorously weed out those who do not comply with those 996 demands. So, of course, this spilled into a broader debate around both work-life balance and the productivity that is required from workers in tech companies in China, and not only. So we thought we would have a look at these practices in a broader context. China is by no means the only place where 996 is a practice. And actually looking at where people work the longest, China doesn't even make the top five. A UBS study, for instance, found that workers who worked the most were in other emerging market cities, places such as Mumbai, Hanoi, Mexico City, New Delhi and Bogota. And the Quartz India article points out that 996 is no big deal in the Indian context. And in fact, comparisons on yearly work hours point to the fact that in Mumbai, workers work up to 3,315 hours, which compares with just over 2,000 hours in Beijing, which is still a lot, obviously, by Western standards, but that China is by no means alone with the phenomenon of long working hours, especially in tech sectors, of which India obviously has a fairly big one. And at this point, let's not forget that this is not just a practice in emerging economies. Silicon Valley has long been one of the exporters of the never-ending workday. First, it's been the proponent through the startup culture where people sleep in sleeping bags under their desk, do not take holidays, work nonstop on their businesses. We spoke previously on the podcast about companies like Google and Facebook building something akin to campuses, self-contained places where employees work, where employees can sleep, where they're catered for, they never have to leave their workplace. But also through very visible proponents of this lifestyle, much like Jack Ma in China, in Silicon Valley, we have Elon Musk whose much-touted 120-hour work week really glamorizes workaholism. He's long been celebrated for having an impeccable work ethic, but that means a day that is broken down into five-minute intervals, everything is optimized. He sleeps on a couch in his own office, but he has dedicated his life to the success of Tesla. And let's not forget, we've covered this couch on the podcast as well, right? It's a musk. Exactly. We haven't done those in a while. Elon Musk also sent out a letter in January earlier this year, an email to all the employees when they said, well, full-time staff will be cut by about 7%, yet the people who are left behind will have to work much harder to make Tesla a success. And again, this relied on the fact that Tesla is up against massive entrenched competition, and he said that Tesla must work much, much harder than other manufacturers to survive while building affordable, sustainable products. As he said, 
Building clean energy products as sales requires extreme effort and relentless creativity, but succeeding in our mission is essential to ensure that the future is good. So we must do everything to advance our cause. So in that respect, Elon Musk's call for working hard, working long hours is no different to the ones we've heard from Richard Liu or Jack Ma, just that it doesn't have a fancy hashtag, right? But the work ethos in Silicon Valley is certainly similar to that described arguably at a larger scale within the Chinese sector. But we also want to highlight that working long hours, leaving work late, is quite common in other sectors across Western countries, such as in consulting, in law, other professional services. And even in academia, people tend to work long hours, even though they might not be present in the office. So we want to take a look at the phenomenon of working longer hours from a couple of different angles. We're going to go back to the article in the South China Morning Post, which was titled Quantity or quality, which points to the heart of the matter and the argument made in the article, which basically started off by saying that for quite a while, China was able to compete with the West because of low wages and just having more workers doing the work and therefore competing on what was called a four to one ratio, four employees in China competing with one employee in the West, but increasingly with higher wages competition happens on the same footing. And so the concern in the article is that long work hours are not necessarily conducive to high productivity, to creativity, and the kind of work needed to compete in an innovation economy. They're also not very conducive to people having the time to actually spend the money that they generate at work. Henry Ford, who first advocated the five-day working week back in the heyday of industrialization, who actually realized that having a break of two days, the weekend as we now know it, would allow people to spend the money that they earned working for him, actually buying his product and making him even more successful. So as we said previously, God invented the six-day work week and Henry Ford invented the five-day work week. And on this podcast, we actually covered another possibility, which was the four-day work week. This was back in November last year. And this was an article written by a guy called Rory Sutherland in the UK, who was covering a UK labor politician, John McDonnell, who said that actually we should be considering a four-day work week. Have people working longer for four days, so the 9-9 type of argument, but have them working only for four days a week and much longer into retirement. The argument was that as we are living longer, because retirement for many people is often such a traumatizing cut into their life, they lose purpose in life, they lose their daily routine, oftentimes friendships and social contacts. And companies also lose their most experienced employees who have a wealth of knowledge that they could be sharing with junior colleagues. We should consider working the same number of hours over a lifetime, but stretch those hours over longer periods into our 70s, for example, which incidentally leads to the effect that we would work less during the week, hence having more downtime to relax to recuperate, which would be beneficial to the kind of more innovative, creative work that, and here comes the automation argument, will be more important as we go forward and which harks back to the argument that is now made on the back of 996, which is that just being at work for longer hours, hashtag presenteeism doesn't necessarily mean that we're achieving a lot because people are exhausted. They might not have the leisure to have new ideas, to think about things because they feel the peer pressure that they have to be seen to be working these hours. So we'll include our previous detailed conversation about the four-hour work week in the show notes, because interestingly there we talked about both anecdotal and scientific evidence to show that the four-day work week has real productivity benefits. It improves well-being, it improves relationships, it improves innovation, and so on and so forth. So why are the technology captains in China pushing 996? Why are they not going back to less hours if the evidence points towards being more innovative if people have more downtime? To me, and we've had this conversation before, I think it's really a problem of coordination. For that to happen, you would actually need 
collective action. It's very difficult for just a few workers, even if that's a lot of workers, but for not all the workers to require this. It will be perceived as being lazy or trying to slack off. We've seen Richard Liu's comments. And it's also very difficult for certain institutions to go at it while the norm in other companies is to do 996. So it is really as much a cultural shift as it would be a regulatory shift. It would involve collective action or coordination on behalf of the employees. And it's also a contextual matter. Just reducing the hours in the current system doesn't necessarily mean you're being more innovative over time. But it might, in the short term, reduce the output that people are producing. And if you're in a cutthroat competition, as perceived by these companies and resonated in the comments by Richard Liu, the risk of going back in work hours might actually be too great in the short term. So this change will have to happen gradually, and it will have to actually come from something like collective action or regulation, because each individual firm will find it too risky to enact this. And the second story we picked for today from The Guardian actually points to one reason that this will become actually increasingly difficult to do. The second story is titled UK Businesses Using Artificial Intelligence to Monitor Staff Activity. And it reports on the ISAC system. ISAC is a so-called HR or people analytics software system that collects a whole bunch of data about employees and feeds it into a machine learning algorithm to make certain predictions. And we'll come up with a whole bunch of analytics around which people perform the best, which people work the longest hours, are people writing emails. And it's actually couched in a very positive uh, light. The company has the slogan, transform workplace well-being. And they talk about understanding people's email responsiveness looking at who might experience email overload or signals of being overworked. So the message is all in a very positive, improving the workers' health and well-being kind of way. The article reports on the fact that the system will show bosses who are your collaborative workers, who are your influencers, who are your change makers. But think about this. I will have real-time insights into each employee and the work they do in the organization and their position in your network. Now, that data is not seen by the employee. It's only available to their boss, who can then make judgments about how hard the employee is working or how much they're slacking off or how much better they could be doing within a certain amount of time. So the point here is that The way in which the company talks about its product makes a fair few assumptions about how the product will be used because the information that might point out which workers are at risk of being overworked could equally be used to judge which people are slacking off. And so the overworking might actually uh, be a good signal, right? People are working hard. 996. Whereas people who do not send enough emails, who do not log enough activity in the keyboard key logging data might be seen to be slacking off because they're not actually doing work. They might just be sitting around and thinking about the world. So there is a real risk here that all of us will be under increasing pressure to show off, to show that we're doing work, to be seen as busy, not to have any inactive time or to be seen as working late and so on. And so what we want to point out is that this is actually a continuation of the earlier argument in the sense that these systems, when used across a workplace, can lead to what we might call a digital panopticon, where people know that they're being locked, they don't know what happens to this data, but it will lead to behavior change. So people will have to appear busy. It might lead to a whole new level of busy work, and reports from companies using the software point to the fact that people are skipping breaks, they engage in computer work because they know that their keystrokes are being locked at the expense of engaging in other activities such as talking to people, collaborating by way of walking around the office, having those serendipitous moments that we've discussed in the context of co-working spaces and being innovative and creative at work. So here we might actually have an AI data analytics driven approach which incidentally might have similar effects to the practice of long working hours. 
And let's not forget, all of these companies will thus make decisions about what gets tracked and implicitly then make decisions about what counts as work. If me walking around, talking to you or asking questions or even daydreaming is not measured, then that doesn't count as work. That is slacking off. So, for example, if I wanted to come up with a metric that measures collaboration, how do I do this? So I could look at how much do I contribute to conversations on an enterprise social network such as Yammer or Microsoft Teams or Slack. I could measure how many people I communicate with via email. But it would be hard to measure how many people I have conversations with in my lunch break or that I walk around in the office. So knowing this, I might change my behavior and now just randomly post things in these platforms because that gets me a better engagement or collaboration score. So it goes back to whatever gets measured gets done. And interestingly, some companies have even attempted to measure those serendipitous moments through Fitbits, or I think it was one of the big car manufacturers that had employees wear badges around so that you would know who they spent lunch with and whether they socialized during lunch. So the surveillance and measurement of your activities can even intrude in those moments. And not surprisingly, we've seen that through a couple of other articles that reported on IBM using artificial intelligence to predict when employees will quit. And in this case, they were using a range of signals that were not disclosed. So they might be things on social media that you're posting. There might be things that you're posting on LinkedIn. How much you engage in your social network or how many emails you write. And while IBM itself says they are not at this point monitoring email conversations, you can see where this argument is going. So people who disengage at work might be more at risk of leaving in the next little while. So the CEO of IBM said that the program has to date saved IBM almost $300 million by being able to retain many of their employees. Let's remember IBM employs roughly 350,000 people. And obviously, when someone is flagged at risk of leaving, and this practice is called predictive attrition, so it has a fancy name, then the company would look at the performance of the individual and their predicted net worth to the company, so as an economic argument. And if the company decides that it must retain this person, because remember, hiring people is costly, losing talent is costly, then there's obvious cost savings in maybe offering a promotion or a salary raise and keeping the employee that is at risk of defecting. So where we wanted to end up with this conversation today is that often these conversations in the media have been defined in terms of practices at work, how many hours we work, what systems we use to improve the well-being of employees in the workplace or to retain employees. But what we're actually seeing underneath this is actually a discussion about what work is and when work is. And so hashtag future of work, when we talk about the future of work, we often talk narrowly about what technologies are we going to use to measure work, how are we going to work, where are we going to work, co-work spaces, we work and the lot. But what we think is one of the most important discussions is what work actually is. Because in all of the stories that we've discussed today, there are implicit assumptions of what counts as work. 996 points to the fact that being at work is work. Being there, spending long hours is actually what defines work. Whereas the four-day work week goes to the point that there's a qualitative issue with work. That work is something that gets done that doesn't necessarily tie in with being at work. And the measurement argument points to the fact that we have these implicit assumptions about what work is, but that all of this is pretty much in flux and will be the conversation going forward. But we really couldn't let this week go without saying one other thing that's happened in the future this week, which was that Game of Thrones has returned with the final series. And in that, we actually came across a story about algorithms predicting attrition, not at work, but in Game of Thrones. So our third story, a quick future bite. 
from Hypebeast is titled An Algorithm Predicted Which Characters Will Die During the Final Game of Thrones Season. So it's not exactly a spoiler alert because the company has been very tight-lipped. We do not know what's going to happen. Even the none of the actors were able to divulge anything about how the Game of Thrones final season will end. But here's an AI to foretell the future. So here's based on machine learning who will die, who will get the short end of the stick with a 93.5% chance. Ta-da! Bronn is predicted to die. The mountain has an 80.3% chance of dying, followed by Sansa and Bran Stark with 733 and 57.8% chance of dying. Oh, shit. And who's safe? The safest based on this algorithm is Daenerys Targaryen with a 0.9% chance of death. And Tyrion, you'll be glad to know, will also make it with a 2.5% chance of death. And even Jaime Lannister is in the running with an only 4% chance of dying. Which leaves us with two things to say. First of all, no word on Jon Snow. Why is this? Is it because he's already dead? That might well be the case. I also want to point out that machine learning algorithms, as we've pointed out in the past, are really good making predictions from the past to the future to extrapolate. But Game of Thrones has shown us time and time again that the author does not really care and kills off quite randomly those characters that we least expect will die. So I guess there's still suspense. We will revisit this in the following weeks. And this is all we have time for today. See you soon. On the future. Next week. This week? Yes, but next week. On the future this week. Next week. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. This was the future this week. Made possible by the Sydney Business Insights team and members of the Digital Disruption Research Group. And every week right here with us, our sound editor, Megan Wedge, who makes us sound good. And keeps us honest. Our theme music was composed and played live on a set of garden hoses by Lindsay Pollack. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us online on Flipboard, Twitter, or sbi.sydney.edu.au. If you have any news that you want us to discuss, please send them to sbi.sydney.edu.au.